all trauma, anxiety, fears, they all map back to stress in some way. Now you can have stress without trauma, you can have anxiety without trauma, but you can't really have trauma without stress and anxiety. So even though there aren't really strict definitions of the boundaries between trauma and stress and fear, I think it's fair to say that trauma is a fear and or stress response that's happening at the wrong times, right? It's sort of carrying over from an experience that's making life uncomfortable or in some cases exceedingly challenging. For example? So um, someone has a you know sexual assault, mm -hmm. um, somebody sees a car accident or is in a car accident, um, veterans come back from overseas. There's kind of first person trauma where something happens to somebody and then there's third person trauma where somebody sees something terrible happen. Mm -hmm. There's grief and so there are a lot of categories and so we don't want to complicate the, the landscape and the answer but I think it's important for people to understand that the stress response is at the core of all of this. And when we talk about stress, I think it's also important that we divide that into two kinds of stress because okay. it defines the two approaches that people can take to combat stress, fear, anxiety. What are the two types of stress? Okay, the two types of stress are we, the one is the one we're almost all familiar with because when we hear stress, we think pupils dilating, hands shaking, heart beating, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, are really upset, you're stuck in traffic, something is really bothering you, you're angry, you're having the, the fight or flight response that you know, that phrase gets thrown around a lot. And in that, those circumstances, it's very important that people take control of their mind and their body in a way that allows themselves to calm down, to reduce the so-called stress response. And we can talk about tools to do that, that are very concrete and that are very reliable. There's another side of the stress response. So what would that, that stress be called? What's that type of stress? Ah, uh, so um, unfortunately there's no <laughs> name for this. This is one of the important things. Maybe we'll figure it out today. Okay. Maybe your audience will figure it out. Yeah. They're, they're a smart bunch and they're living this stuff too. So um, unfortunately there isn't a word for this, but um, when this I, is one type of stress. This is one type of stress, which is you're, you're too activated, you're too alert, you're too agitated and you want to be less alert, less mm. activated and less agitated. The alert stress. That's right. We could call it the alert stress, well, hyper alert stress. Hyper alert stress. Hyper, let's just do that for sake of conversation uh -huh. today. And we are by no means a nomenclature committee, <laughs> so we can always revise later. Yeah. There's another side of stress, which is when there are a lot of things happening in the world, pandemics, you can't work because they've shut, there's another shutdown or um, there's strife in your life or things are really challenging and you're feeling exhausted and you can't get mobilized and alert enough. Mm. And this has never really been cleanly laid out for people that and what I call the whole process is one of limbic friction. Okay, so the limbic system are these areas deep in the brain. Limbic literally means edge. They're near the edge of the brain. Mm. And when we're stressed, there's a lot of activity in these brain regions. And then we got this, our forebrain, our prefrontal cortex for the aficionados. And when we're in a thinking and calm and deliberate and rational manner, when we can control our body and our mind, it's called a top-down processing. We're, we're controlling ourselves. But there's a lot of friction with that limbic pathway. I promise I'll get to the practices uh -huh. soon. So <clears throat> when there's this friction, we can call it limbic friction for sake of discussion, there, you can't control all those impulses and all that anxiety or fatigue for too long. And in fact, as you get more tired, or if someone has frontal damage, if they have brain damage to the frontal lobes, what you find is they become more impulsive. Mm. When they feel like sleeping, they just sleep, even if it's socially inappropriate. When they feel like yelling or screaming or swearing, they just, they just do that. And so mm. there's two kinds of limbic friction. One is when we're too activated and we want to calm down and we're trying to say, okay, calm down. Don't say, don't say the thing that you know you shouldn't say. <laughs> don't do the thing you, don't, you, know, you shouldn't do. And then there's the other kind of limbic friction, which is the world is happening really fast and we feel buried, we're overwhelmed, and we need to get more activated. We need more energy. We need more energy. We need to be mm -hmm. able to lean into life and we're feeling overwhelmed. What's that called? Well, we, we should come up with a name now. <laughs> so that would be... Um, exhaustion like stress. Exhaustion or, stress. Yeah. Or, um, overwhelm stress. Or, or overwhelm stress. Yeah. Or um, Now, a lot of people start giving these names to things that sound almost like clinical syndromes, mm. which sometimes they are, but they'll say things like adrenal burnout, 
which actually doesn't exist. <laughs> adrenal adrenal fatigue. The, uh, now there is something called um, adrenal insufficiency syndrome, which is a real medical condition where people can't actually produce enough adrenaline. Mm -hmm. But most of us have enough adrenaline in our bodies to last 200 years, two lifetimes. So you, the adrenals don't really burn out. What happens is people are so overactivated. They're in this alertness, hyper alert stress for so long that eventually they kind of crash into the over fatigue stress. Okay. So one, one turns into the other one. Right. So the first thing for anyone trying to navigate stress, and then we'll talk about trauma, yeah. is to understand in what kind of stress they're dealing with. Are you exhausted and having a hard time getting your energy up? Mm -hmm. Or is your energy too high and you're having a hard time getting your energy down? Mm. Because the solutions to those are often quite different. So on the previous um, time we met, uh, we talked about a, a tool for calming the body very quickly, which is this double inhale, long exhale. Typically the inhales are done through the nose, the exhale through the mouth. So the physiological sigh, which was discovered by scientists in the 30s, and then Jack Feldman's group at UCLA has really identified the underlying brain circuits, and then my lab is now looking at this stuff in humans in a kind of more clinical setting. That double inhale, followed by an exhale, we know is the fastest real-time tool for taking one's state of alertness down. The hyper alert right. stress. Right. You're not yeah. gonna crash into sleep, but you're going from, hyper, you're not feeling good, you're too agitated, you wanna calm down. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that tool is it speaks to a principle which is, it's very hard to control the mind with the mind. So when you're stressed, <laughs> just telling yourself, don't stress, don't stress, don't stress, calm down, calm down, rarely works. It also rarely works to tell someone else to calm down. To relax, hey, relax, yeah. Usually it has the opposite effect. <laughs> don't tell me to relax. And it, and it can be damaging for relationships. If you've uh, ever, you know, someone's really stressed and you tell them to relax, sometimes it actually can create more friction and they don't sure. feel supported. What should they do in that moment? They should look to the body. The nervous system includes the brain, but also all the connections to the body and yeah. back again. And so the, when you can't control your mind, you want to do something purely mechanical, like the physiological side. Because that, you know, once you take control of the body in that way, then the mind mm. starts to fall under the umbrella of this top-down <clears throat> control again. Top-down control is what children and puppies don't have. You know, if, if, if we had a, yeah, I've got a 10 year old bulldog, his name's Costello. He does, barely does anything now because he's Costello. But he, but when he was a puppy, everything was a stimulus. He would walk over, pick up a cord and chew on it. And then he'd drop it and he'd pivot to something else. And it's because they have, they literally have no prefrontal cortex wired into this limbic system. They don't have this suppression. So there's no friction. The limbic system just does whatever it wants. And actually in humans with frontotemporal dementia, and in certain people who have front uh, temporal brain damage, they become mm -hmm. very impulsive. My dad went through, I don't know if I talked about this the last time, so. but my dad had a, uh, a traumatic car accident 15 years ago. It was 15 years ago, a couple months ago, where a car went on top of his car and went through the windshield and the bumper hit him in his head. Pretty much split open his head. His girlfriend at the time was holding his head together, went to the hospital, airlifted in a helicopter. He's in a coma for three months. And it's been a 15 year journey where we had to teach him, reteach him how to write, how to talk, how to walk, like everything, where it was almost like he was my father in his body, but his mind was having to relearn like a child. And even today when I see him and visit him, he'll, he'll swear just compulsively, he'll, he'll do things that maybe aren't appropriate because he probably doesn't have the I don't know, you can probably tell me better as a neuroscientist, but what happens when someone has brain damage, especially in the front uh, frontal cortex? What, what happens to the brain? Yeah, so these top, when I say top-down control, there's literally a set of wires, we call mm. them axons, from the prefrontal cortex that suppresses these impulsive behaviors in the limbic system. And when there's damage, it's essentially removing that break. Mm. And you know, in adults, uh, older adults especially, because their behaviors aren't quite as, um, you know, because they're older, they're, they aren't necessarily going to walk over and punch people or, or scream out <laughs> right. explicatives and these right. kinds of things, um, fortunately. Although sometimes you it see happens. that, sometimes you see that, um, sadly. But those circuits aren't functioning well. And in young children, if you ever go to a classroom, uh, I guess now kids are home a lot, but in a ki typical kindergarten classroom, what you'll notice is that some of the kids can sit very still. 
and other kids are rocking back and forth yes. and moving around a ton and the teacher and is constantly trying to people cor- yeah. I was one of those kids yeah, like, me too. You know, exactly like, <laughs> trying to corral the children and children mature at different rates mm. and what's what you're seeing there is the different maturation of their frontal cortex. When you see a child that's very deliberate and can really control their speech and their behavior, you're looking at a child that has a lot of top-down control. The frontal cortex is really mm. engaged. Now, is that well, genetic? Is that uh... it's probably a mixture? It's probably a mixture of environmental influences and mm-hmm. genetic, like most things. Yeah. And I'm not trying to just hedge here. Sure. I, I think um, you know, like for instance, I have a, a niece who. Um, is adopted and um, she's very deliberate and very calm and so we you know we wonder you know what what you know is this genetic is it nature nurture you know there's probably some genetic bias and then there's probably also um, a lot of environmental mm-hmm. influences I mean a lot of what we're taught in school and at home because a lot of kids are homeschooled now is about what not to do right you know sit still don't, do don't say this don't say that you know we get the please, say please and thank you you know, you know sit up straight you know do your dishes kind of stuff but a lot of the the don't language hmm. is designed to around these things of top-down control, yeah. which set up a lot of important social constraints. Right. And we've all felt this as adults too. Where in two ways, it becomes really extreme when we can't control that limbic system. One is when we're when we're very fatigued. When we're fatigued or we're sick or we're in pain, physical pain, chances are when something bothers us, we're closer to that threshold of saying the thing that we wish. We're we on our patience. Say. Exactly. No patience. That's right. So how do we learn to have patience when we are hyper alert or overwhelm, exhaust, and stress? Okay. So when we are in hyper alert, there's a mechanism associated with that that makes our internal world measure time differently. What happens under those conditions is you feel like the external world is moving very slowly. Mm. I think I might have mentioned this in the, our previous meeting, yeah. but when you're really stressed on the hyper alert side, it seems like the world is going very slowly. You're gonna, just knowing that, and knowing that it's likely that you're gonna feel impatient and if the world is moving much too slow. Sort of like if you're, you're trying to get someplace on time and the person in front of you doesn't know you're where like, you're going. No, I was the guy not knowing where I was going this morning. <laughs> and so, and we can't see each other in cars. So you think, what is this person doing? Oh my goodness. And they're just looking for the right turn. Yeah. You know? So there's that. And then when we are fatigued, it seems like the world is going really fast, okay? And so for people who are exhausted, everything feels overwhelming. Now, of course, the rate that things are actually moving in the world is the same, but the perception is that it's just too much and we can't cope. So we talked about a tool to calm oneself. Mm-hmm. The reason I like the physiological side is we, we are all equipped with the pathway. If people wanna know if there's some medically oriented folks out there, or if you wanna teach this to other folks, there's a nerve called the phrenic nerve, P-H-R-E-N-I-C, that goes from the brain down to the diaphragm that controls that and then controls the lungs. Mm. And so when you decide, okay, I'm gonna use the side, the physiological side to calm myself, in a way you're engaging top-down control because you're you're taking control of your internal landscape mm-hmm. rather than trying to take control of your thinking, which is very hard. You can't fix your mind with your mind sometimes. Trying to control the mind with the mind is like trying to grab fog. It's just gonna <laughs> keep moving, right? If you've ever tried to grab or, or smoke, it just moves. It doesn't, you, it's, it's vapors, you're never gonna grab it. The key is to is to um, is to take control of the system by taking control of a real physical entity, this phrenic nerve. Um, and the reason I describe this stuff is not to put a lot of unnecessary detail, but I think when people realize this isn't something that you build up over time and then are able to do, that you literally have a wire, set of wires that goes down to your diaphragm, this muscle in your ab- ab- abdomen that can move your lungs. And then as you blow off carbon dioxide, when you do that exhale, you, your brain starts to calm down and then your mind, the top-down control of the cortex, can start taking control of the limbic system again. It's like you're, it's almost like you're, you're losing control of the automobile and you're trying to steer, but really there's another lever that if you just pull it, then the, sta- the steering wheel will stabilize mm. for you. So that's the way to think about the physiological sigh. On the other side of things, when you're feeling overwhelmed and fatigued, there are two ways to approach that. First is the kind of foundation of fatigue, which is almost always poor sleep and scheduling of sleep. This is something that doesn't get discussed a lot. And I don't think I've discussed this on any podcast previously, but you know, getting better at sleeping is a whole set of practices, but sleep is a slow tool. It's not a real time tool. Cause mm-hmm. if you're feeling exhausted and you have to get up and have your day, deal with children, deal with work, deal with life, 
we can talk about how to get better at sleeping, but in real time, what you want to do is you want to bring more alertness into the system. Focus. Focus and alertness. The way to do that is to take advantage of a very well-established medical fact. All medical students learn this, all MBs know this, which is that there's a direct relationship between how you breathe and your heart rate. Hmm. And so I'll give a little bit of the background and then I'll give the specific sure. practice just so that um, people understand where this is coming from. So when we inhale, when we inhale, it almost feels like everything's moving up. But actually what happens is our diaphragm moves down. Okay, so when we inhale, our diaphragm moves down. When that happens, our heart literally gets a little bit bigger. The volume of the heart gets a little bit bigger, which means that whatever blood in there is moving per unit time a little bit slower. And there's a set of neurons in the heart called the sinoatrial node that sends a signal to the brain and says, hey, blood flow is slowing down. And the brain sends a signal back to the heart and says, okay, let's speed up and speeds up the heart rate. So the short, concise way to put it is when you inhale more vigorously or longer, you're speeding up your heart rate. This is, uh, this actually, there's a name for it in the medical community, but the important thing to understand is as you inhale, you're sending a neural signal to your heart to speed up. And when you exhale, the diaphragm moves up, the heart gets a little bit smaller, literally, because there's less space there. Then there's a signal sent to the brain and the brain sends a signal back and says slow down the heart rate and so so this is happening people, quickly so if you inhale it's speeding up that's right if you exhale it's slowing it that's down. right so if you want to become more alert you actually can just simply make your inhales a little bit more vigorous or a little bit longer than your exhale so if, let's say you get up Quicker in the morning. In, or longer inhale, sl uh, shorter exhale. That's right. To, not to speed up your heart rate and to be more alert. Not longer exhale, double intake. Right. So, shorter, yeah. the, so longer or more vigorous inhales will speed up your heart rate and make you more alert. Longer or more vigorous or more vigorous exhales will slow down your heart rate and make you less alert. Wow. And there's this has a name, which is as as, you know, it's a certain kind of arrhythmia, but that makes it sound bad. This is actually what's happening all the time. This is the basis of heart rate variability. When people talk about heart rate variability is good, you know, that you don't want your heart rate to be one level all day, high or low. A lot of people don't realize that. They think, oh, I got a nice, slow heart rate. And you think, well, all day long, when well, you're asleep, then. that's right. Well, well, slow heart rate is better than high heart, artificially hot, you know, sorry, excessively high heart rate. But you don't want your heart rate to be like this. You want your heart rate to go through these fluctuations. Heart rate variability is good. Why? Because heart rate variability reflects the activation of what's typically called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the brain's ability to slow down and calm the nervous system. So mm. a, when your heart rate is going like this, it means that your heart rate is speeding up and then your brain is slowing it down. Your heart rate is speeding it up and your brain is slowing it down. And that's what's happening all day long as you're moving through things in a kind of calm alert way. But when you get that troubling text message or you see a post or a comment and you go, and all of a sudden your heart rate just goes doo -doo 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 -doo, and you feel like you immediately want to respond or you're going to say the thing that maybe you shouldn't say, or you're going to do the thing that maybe you shouldn't do, <laughs> or you just want to be thought more thoughtful and more targeted in your response. The key is to slow down the heart rate by making your exhales longer mm -hmm. or more vigorous. So it could simply be and then shorter inhales, longer exhales, or do the physiological side. Or if you wake up in the morning and you're experiencing the other kind of stress, which is you look at your Sluggish phone in the news and like, the world is overwhelming me. My life is overwhelming. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't even know what sequence I'm gonna do things in. You're just discombobulated. And a lot of people struggle with this. The key is to do a few breaths, even while you're getting out of bed and, and preparing your morning coffee or water or whatever it is, and just start breathing in a way that's inhale emphasized. <sighs> Which sounds weird, but basically what you're doing is you're speeding up your heart rate. At some point, usually within only two or three of those breaths, you're gonna feel more alert, and wow. then you can just go back to breathing normally. So you don't and, have to do this for hours, you do this for no. a few moments or minutes. That's right, and, and while I'm a fan of breath work as its own thing, because breath work can teach you how to operate these levers in your brain and body, so to speak. Breath work is a dedicated practice that you do away from these stressful events. Whereas learning to control your heart rate and 
thereby your mind using your breathing. So it goes breathing, heart rate, mind in that sequence. So if your mind isn't where you want it to be, don't start with the mind. Start with your breathing, then which will control your heart rate, which will then allow you to control your mind. So don't, don't think your way out of a, a moment of stress. Feel, breathe your way out of this moment That's of right. stress. That's right. And, and one of the things, and I'm, I'm certain there are gonna be people out there listening to this saying, wait a second, the, yog, the yogis and the yoga community has been talking about this for centuries. What are you doing? You know, this is just a re, recasting of what we already know. I agree, I agree. Within the science community, these things have been given crazy names like arrhythmias mm -hmm. and heart rate variability and um, the diaphragm and the phrenic nerve. And so the, the language of science has known all about this for many centuries also, but it's been shrouded by language. And the yoga community has known about this for a long time, but it's been shrouded by language. So by bringing this discussion forth, I'm by, I just want to be clear that I, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel or pretend that I invented the wheel by any stretch. I'm trying to say that we all have these circuits, these levers in our body that we can that we can pull and push. And people learn how to do this intuitively, but we're never really taught the underlying mechanisms. And I do believe that once, and yoga is not big on mechanisms. They're very good on naming and on, you know, yogis in different areas of the world, when they say something, they usually know what the other one is talking about. Mm -hmm. Scientists do as well. But mechanism, if people can just understand a little bit about why the heart slows down when you exhale more than you inhale or why the heart speeds up when you inhale more than you exhale. I do believe that having that knowledge in the mind allows people in a moment of stress to say, oh, I understand what's happening to me and therefore I should go to this particular tool. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do understand that one doesn't need to understand how an engine works in order to drive a car, but you do need to know how the control panels work. <laughs> right, right, right. This is why we send people to driving school yeah. and why we don't let 10 year olds drive.